This episode is about setters and includes their interaction with both a cyclops and the mighty Greek warrior Odysseus. Satyrs. They were strange male beings who roamed the forests and the wildlands of ancient Greece. Let me describe their appearance. Remember, I just called them strange. Think of four or five creatures rolled into one. At a glance, they were obviously male, but one variety had the lower body of a goat or a ram while others had the abdomen and legs of a man. All had a horse's tail. They had snub noses and hair as long as a horse's mane. Add to that their wild beards, receding hairlines, pig's ears, and nubby horns. You get the idea. But their defining and most memorable characteristic was below the waist because they were constantly in a state of lust. They were, all in all, ridiculous looking. This is episode 22 of Garner's Greek Mythology. We have listeners from 114 countries and counting, so welcome to everyone, wherever you are. I'm your host, mythologist, and best-selling author, Patrick Garner. You can read more about my novels and about this podcast at patrickgarnerbooks.com. All of my books imagine the ancient gods living in modern times. As always, this podcast will focus on one thing, Greek gods, of course. Here, the ancient gods are not considered imaginary. Hardly. Instead, they, like you, are here now. Satyrs were, in some ways, the male equivalent of nymphs, but in reality the similarities were few. Both lived in forests and distant glades and rarely bothered with clothes. Both the company gods and goddesses as companions. Satyrs were frequently found in the company of Dionysus, Ares, Hermes, Hephaestus, and Pan, who found them amusing and even Gaia, who withheld judgment of their behavior. It's easiest to sum them up as ne'er-do-wells. They were regulars at Dionysus's raves, along with the wanton maenades, women who followed the wine god from rave to rave. Nymphs, on the other hand, acted as environmental guardians and personified the gentle aspects of nature. Satyrs were rude frequently drunk and always ready to party down. Scholars have no idea about the satyr's origin. The ancient writer Homer never even mentions them. But Hesiod, his contemporary, writing around 800 BC, refers to them repeatedly, calling them a race good for nothing and unfit for work. The Roman writer Virgil notes that like all gods dwelling in forests and fields, satyrs were dreaded by mortals. No good came from encountering one. I say one. But they were always found in bands, or as commonly described by the ancient Greeks, in rebels and pecks. Women were particularly at risk, as all satyrs adored them and wouldn't take no for an answer. There were at least four distinct types of satyrs. Shepherds identified one type as pans, that is P-A-N-S. These rustic spirits protected goat herds and flocks of sheep. They were depicted as having more goatish features than the satyrs that hung out with Dionysus. A second type was called silenes or silenoi. These were elderly satyrs. The most famous was named Silenus, and we'll look at some of his adventures soon. Another type was called satyriskoi. These were child satyrs. They were depicted as adorable young boys, lacking beards and muscles. A final type was the titeroi, or flute-playing satyrs. They played a double pipe and 
were almost always seen in the company of Dionysus. So in classical literature, we find old satyrs, young satyrs, satyrs who protected shepherds' flocks, and flute-playing satyrs. Yet however depicted, all loved to dance and drink and play. It was really their sole purpose in life. A moment ago, I mentioned the satyr named Silenus. He was a leader of them all. He was known to have many qualities, some good and some not. They included unusual wisdom, an endless desire for drink, and the ability to prophesy. He was one of Dionysus' childhood tutors, entrusted by Hermes to help raise the motherless child. Because Silenus was famous as a prophet, he was captured by a local king and told to share his wisdom. To the king's shock, sly Silenus skipped prophecy altogether and said that the best thing that could happen to a mortal was not to be born, and that the second best thing for a mortal was to die as quickly as possible. Needless to say, upon hearing these pronouncements, the king released Silanus back into the wild with a vat of wine and a sharp blow to his head. Now back to where he wanted to be, Silanus continued the satyr cycle of carousing, debauchery, and sleep that would overcome the satyrs one by one. As you know, the Greeks had many gods and included Silanus in their pantheon. He had a major temple in Elis. There, a statue of the goddess Methe, or drunkenness, stood by his side, handing him a cup of wine. Why elevate a satyr in the goddess of drunkenness? Well, the Greeks considered wine to be one of the greatest gifts received by mankind and acknowledged it as the only way to wash away one's sorrows. The satyrs took this understanding to a new level, declaring that the best way to live was to dance, drink, and be merry. I'll note that satyrs appear in my second book, Cycladic Girls. There they act as sidekicks to Ares, the war god. They face off with Artemis and Temessa in a grand finale in a small town in France. Cycladic Girls, like all my books, is available on Amazon. But before we write satyrs off as mere playboys, let's stick with Silenus. He seems to have had an uncanny ability to associate with both gods and famous mortals. Aside from his association with Dionysus, he had a memorable encounter with the Greek warrior Odysseus. In a previous episode, we followed Odysseus after his ship left Troy for home. He was thwarted by one god after another. His ten-year journey included landing on the shores of Mount Etna in Sicily. There, he and his starving men encountered old Silenus, who, himself with his many satyrs, had been blown onto the same shores. Silenus had been in pursuit of Dionysus, who was rumored to have been captured by pirates and held for ransom. He had vowed to save the wine god, but found himself facing an active volcano and worse, a mighty, one-eyed giant known as a Cyclops. The Cyclops were a race of unusual beings, all with a massive eye in the center of their forehead. All were antisocial and lived at great distances from each other. To Silenius' delight, this one-eyed giant loved to drink. The more wine, the better. And he, like the satyrs, had a lifetime pattern of drinking, eating, and sleeping. Unlike the satyrs, he loved to eat men who wandered onto his beaches. Luckily for Silenus and the rest of the satyrs, their flesh was considered disgusting. Rather than eat them, he turned them into slaves. So instead of rescuing Dionysus who had rescued himself quite easily without their help. The satyrs became 
servants to the Cyclops. That's a roundabout way of getting to the rest of the story, where the Cyclops and Satyrs meet Odysseus. The ancient Greek playwright Euripides gives us this story. The play was first performed about 2,500 years ago. And it goes like this. One day a boat washed onto Etna's shores. It was, in fact, Odysseus's once mighty warship. Starved and thirsty, he and his crew had no idea where they'd landed. To their surprise, as they straggled up from the beach, they came face to face with an old satyr who stood, arms crossed. Silenus challenged Odysseus, saying, I greet you, stranger. Tell me your name and nation, for we rarely see men in these parts. Odysseus replied, I am the king of Ithaca. My name is Odysseus. Can you show us to a stream? Our thirst is killing us. Silenus shook his head, saying, Of course, but what brings you here? Odysseus said, An ill wind. We were forced ashore. Then he looked around and remarked, Where are all the houses and fortresses and men? The satyr said quietly, This is not a place of men. Greece's famous warrior then said, Then what? A place of wild animals? No, said the satyr. You have come to where a cyclops lives. He inhabits a cave, not a house. Odysseus asked, Does this cyclops love gods and welcome strangers? Silenus replied, Strangers are his favorite appetizer. Pausing, Odysseus said, Surely you aren't saying he eats strangers. The old satyr said, He has eaten every stranger who's set foot here since we arrived. Suddenly the cyclops approached, shaking the ground with each step. Seeing the old satyr talking to men on the beach, he bellowed, Who are these people near my cave? Silenus whispered, These men beat me up when I tried to stop them from robbing you blind. What? the one-eyed giant screamed. But don't they know I'm a god? How dare they? The satyr said, I told them, but that didn't stop them from plundering all that they could find. He went on, I wrestled with them. But there are too many. I warned them about you, but they said they'd tie you up like a dog, then whip you till you cried. <laughs> the cyclops struck himself on his forehead, as if that was the funniest thing he'd heard. Did they? He laughed. Then he demanded, Sharpen my carving knives. Get a blaze going on the hearth. I'll have my fill of them all. The giant herded Odysseus and his men into his cave and wasted no time in carving up two of them. But Odysseus was nothing if not wily. As if they were best friends, Odysseus kept filling the giant's wine cup. Soon he was drunk, and then like a drunken satyr, he fell into a deep sleep. Instantly, Odysseus pulled a long log out of the fire and sharpened its end. Then he pushed it back into the flames until the tip smoked and burned bright. Lifting it to his shoulder, he drove the log into the cyclops' eye. Screaming, the god rose and stumbled around in a blind fury. Odysseus and his men fled the cave, grabbing water and food on their way back to the ship. Old Silenus watched it all, smiling to himself. He knew that the blind Cyclops would never know when an old satyr decided to stop his work to steal a cup of wine. Join me for the next episode of Garner's Greek Mythology. This is your host, Patrick Garner. 
If you love what you hear, leave me a review. They really matter. And be sure to visit patrickgarnerbooks.com or find me on Amazon.